Well, good morning again, church. Always happy to be able to share God's word with you. I invite you, if you have a Bible with you, open it up to this passage. Uh, We're going to be looking at it a lot in some detail. So, yeah, I want us together just to work through everything that we just heard. So if you have your Bibles or even on on your phone or whatever, uh, look up this passage, Matthew 23, 1 through 12. Matthew 23, 1 through 12. So, have you ever heard someone say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious? I think one of the slogans, one of the catchphrases of our day is, I, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And if you ask many non-Christians today why they don't go to church, often you'll hear something along those lines. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Or maybe... I believe in a higher power, but I don't subscribe to institutional religion. You know what I'm talking about? You've heard people say that kind of thing, right? And, you know, to be fair, I think we can sympathize with people who say those things. You know, a lot of people have had really negative church experiences, and the church is supposed to be this place known for love and inclusion and and forgiveness and compassion. But unfortunately, when you check out the research, studies indicate that the three things that people associate churches with, more than anything else, is intolerance, homophobia, and hypocrisy. That's just the statistics out there. And so Christianity and religion in general, it gets viewed with suspicion and it gets viewed with disdain because of the way so-called Christians like us have talked about love but refused to be loving, taught about forgiveness but shown no mercy, railed against judging but obsessed and obsessed over people's sins. In other words, people turn away from religion. People turn away from religion when the church preaches without practicing. And you also hear people say, I I don't like religion because it impinges upon my personal freedom. Who is the church to tell me how I should live my life? How dare the pastor or how dare the priest claim so much authority when we know they're just as immoral as everyone else? And so then you might wonder, well, is this, is this slogan, I'm spiritual, not religious, is this confined uh, to non-Christians? No, it's not even confined to non-Christians, not at all. You'll hear more and more people within the church, you know, particularly I find this is true among younger people, saying the exact same thing. I consider myself spiritual, but I'm not really religious. In fact, uh, last week I posted something on Facebook about this, and I couldn't believe the amount of Christian friends that I had who basically said the same thing, that they thought religion was inherently bad. Now, I can handle that. That's fine, right? But perhaps the most shocking thing of all is that Jesus is the one who gets cited as the person who came to abolish institutionalized religion. This is what you hear people say all the time. Apparently they say Jesus comes to free us from religion and replace it with this vague notion of niceness and civility. And you, why am I talking about all this? Well, the reason I'm talking about this long introduction is because I think that today's passage is exactly the sort of text that people use to support this idea. Surely Jesus hates the scribes and the Pharisees. He came to replace the Old Testament law with this new principle of love, didn't he? Jesus told us just to be, you know, just to be nice people. Well, that sounds very easy and that sounds very convenient, but friends, I can tell you, that's just not true. And just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not trying to defend 
sin. And I'm not trying to defend corruption that has taken place within the church. In fact, one of the lectionary readings from today is a, is a passage from Malachi chapter 2. And in this passage, the prophet talks, well, it's actually God talking here, very realistically about the fact that leaders do mess up and about the fact that religion does tend to go wrong. Check out this passage from Malachi. It says, for the lips of a priest, you could say pastor, for the lips of a priest or pastor should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But, talking to the leaders, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi. That's the covenant of priests, right? Says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all people, inasmuch as you have not kept my ways, but you have shown partiality in your instruction. So can church leaders fall into sin? Yes. Can religion go wrong? Absolutely. And it often does. But Jesus isn't anti-religious. I mean, just think about who Jesus is, right? Jesus is a law-abiding, synagogue-attending, Sabbath-keeping, first-century Jew. And far from dismissing the religious texts, Jesus says everything written in the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms, in other words, all of the Old Testament scrolls, they're all about me. Jesus, as you know, understood his messianic identity as firmly rooted in God's covenant. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous sermon ever, Jesus doesn't abolish the law. Jesus actually intensifies the law. Jesus says whoever is angry with his brother is guilty of murder. Jesus says whoever even looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery. Jesus says if your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. Doesn't sound like Jesus hates religion to me. And when we look more closely at today's scripture, we see that Jesus is not anti-religion at all. If you notice in, in verse 3 there, Jesus doesn't say, ignore the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees. What does he say? He says, do what they teach you. Verse 3. Jesus says that they rightly sit on Moses' chair. What do they mean by Moses' chair? Well, Obviously, we're not talking about a literal chair, but the chair of Moses, it's a figurative expression for the teaching authority that's derived from Moses, right? Moses gave, give, gives the law, he gives religion to the Israelites, but then he has to hand it on to someone else uh, to apply it, to interpret it when he's gone. It's a bit like, you know, the idea of uh, Mike Kim, right? Our last pastor here. He, he entrusts his vision to the leaders, then he, when he leaves, we're supposed to be the ones to carry on the seed that he's planted. So the scribes and the Pharisees are successors of the Mosaic tradition, just like pastors are the successors of the Christian religion. And so Jesus recognizes that even when, even when leaders fail to lead by example, even if preachers and pastors are corrupt, it doesn't just mean that all Christian teaching is wrong. Now, I'm not saying this to try and get leaders off the hook. And in fact, I always want to say that you guys have a responsibility to keep the pastoral staff here accountable to their words and their actions. You really do. But Jesus reminds us, don't reject the church just because of the mistakes of some bad apples. Don't throw away religion because some of its leaders are hypocrites. Learn to distinguish between the teaching and the teacher. If your faith is dependent upon the perfection of your leaders, I'm sorry to tell you guys, but your leaders aren't perfect. And again, I'm not, it's, this is not about some open confessional. I'm not trying to say that any of us have done anything wrong, right? But you get the point. You can look for a truth in a teaching even when the teacher might be 
a bad person. Don't hate religion because of hypocrisy. That would be like hating the game of basketball because of a few bad players. It would be like hating pizza because of a few wrong toppings. It would be like hating America because of a few corrupt politicians. I mean, it just doesn't really make sense, does it? Oh, by the way, on a side note, um, speaking of pizza, we are having a young adult uh, lunch after the service today. So I just want to say right now, if you are between the ages of about, we're going to say 21 to 35, although there's some leeway there because I'm 37, so technically I don't even count as a young adult, uh, we'd really love to get to meet you. So if you're, if you're within the age of 21 to 35, please come right after the service in the Young Adult Cafe. Grab a slice of pizza. We want to get to know you. We want to form a community. And some of you, I've been here for two years. Some of you, I, I see you every week, but I still don't know your names. So please, please do make an effort to come just so we can get to know you uh, right after the service today. Sorry about that side note. Okay, so... What is it then that Jesus does take so much issue with in today's passage? Well, quite simply, it's the way that these teachers don't embody what they teach. It's the way that these teachers don't live out their message. Again, don't discard the preaching when it's not practiced, but, and this is the main point today, if church is going to be truly effective, if our church is going to be truly successful, its leaders must practice what they preach. And don't put this all on us, because I think Jesus is not just talking to leaders, he's talking to all Christians. So this passage is not just for me and the other pastors, it's for all of us. Jesus says, and again, follow the passage you have there, Jesus says, you tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and you lay them on the shoulders of people, but you're unwilling to lift a finger to move them. In other words, you make religion so difficult for people, but then you do nothing to help them. You guys ever done anything like that? Do you enjoy maybe just telling people about the Adventist truth and then kind of just walking away? So we love telling people what they need to do, don't we? But how good are we at actually holding their hands through the process of transformation if it takes a long time? But I, I, this is one passage which I love in First Thessalonians. Listen here how Paul throws his whole life into ministry and works tirelessly to make religion not difficult, to make religion easy for people. Paul says... We were gentle among you, as a nursing mother cares for her children. With such affection for you, we were determined to share with you, get this, not only the gospel of God, but our very selves as well. So dearly beloved, had you become to us. You recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and, and drudgery, working night and day in order not to burden any of you, we proclaimed to you, the gospel of God. And what Jesus goes on to say that he hates more than anything is pomp and pretense and self-aggrandizement. The way leaders focus on ostentatious performances of piety with their broad phylacteries and long fringes. What does he mean there? Well, these phylacteries are these small leather boxes that the Jews would wear on their heads, and small leather boxes that would contain biblical texts, you know? And, so, and, and the fringes that he's talking about are the tassels that would have been attached to the Jews and the rabbis to their, to their cloaks, their gowns that they would wear. So he's saying these guys would, would enlarge these phylacteries, would make their tassels longer, in order to draw attention to themselves, right? You get the point? And what does this mean for us? Well, I'm sure that we have similar devices, don't we? Maybe we think, you know, the bigger my Bible is, the more people will think that I read it. Maybe the more expensive my suit is, the more people will take me seriously as a holy man. Maybe the louder I sing, the more people will assume that I'm closer to God. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with big Bibles. This is my Bible. It's quite big, right? 
There's nothing wrong with big Bibles, nothing wrong with nice suits, nothing wrong with singing hymns loudly. But Jesus isn't easily fooled. He knows that people tend to use external objects as a disguise for an, for an internal lack of spirituality. So ask yourselves, what have you used to disguise your lack of spirituality? What do you do on the outside that's covering up what's, what's really going on on the inside? And then Jesus speaks out against those leaders who look for every occasion to get the best seat in the house, where they can be noticed, where they can be revered, where they can be talked about. Those people who need to be addressed with honorific titles, those who need to be the center of attention at every dinner party, at every social event, at every worship service. We all know people like this, don't we? Those people who need everything to be about them. But the church must never encourage that behavior. And in James 2, uh, it's really obvious, in James 2, Scripture forbids very precisely this type of favoritism. Talking about church, check out this passage. If a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your church, and if a person, if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, if you take notice of the one wearing fine clothes and say, oh, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there, sit at my feet. If you do that, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's a pretty indicting passage, isn't it? But in the end, God won't put up with people of high rank who use their reputations to seek attention. And he urges the church, do not give them that attention. And so in his rant about the hypocritical nature of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus isn't rejecting religion. He's saying that whatever these guys are doing simply isn't real religion. Jesus is not anti-religion. Jesus is anti-corrupt religion. That makes sense? So if you reject religion that's gone wrong, if you reject religion that's full of pretension and hypocrisy and attention-seeking, then Jesus says, I'm right there with you. So do I. I hate that religion too, he says. But Scripture says, again in James, describing religion, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. To care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You want to really be religious? Then don't give preferential treatment to the pastors or the leaders or the wealthy or the successful or the popular. Instead, Care for the poor. Care for the vulnerable. Serve those who have nothing to give you in return. Find someone who needs assistance. Find someone who needs friendship. Find someone who needs compassion. And pour your whole life into them. Serve, serve, serve. Jesus ends by reminding us that we really have only one ultimate authority. One rabbi, one teacher, one father. There is only one person we need to impress, only one person who holds us truly accountable. And that is, of course, our God. And we impress him, how? By being truly religious. So to those who say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I want to say that we are religious, but we're focused on getting religion right. And we know what religion is because our teacher, Jesus Christ, embodied it, didn't he? It says in Philippians, though he was in the form of God, 
he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and humbling himself. So friends, let us learn from our one true teacher. Let's embody a religion that's all about humility and service and compassion. My hope is for all of us that we practice what we preach.